Alan hadn't asked y'all in a while. Is everybody reading along in your devotional book and reading your word? Keeping up there? All right. Today we're going to read from Romans 8, 12 to 18. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And now today we get a bonus because Alan asked me also to read that from the message. And I don't know, as you read along with the reading plan, reading the message in parallel or kind of instead of what you've normally read may give you a whole different perspective on things. It's maybe a little bit more uh, readable in some ways. And so, don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's Spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, What's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is, and we know who we are, Father and children. And we know that we're going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with Him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with Him. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and coming good times. just in my way. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, as we come to your word today, open our, our hearts to hear. Lord, you've promised us that, that when we are born again, that you will give us a heart of flesh that you can write your words on, Lord. Not stone tablets, Lord, but our living flesh, that, that we can live by that, that we are your people, that we are children of the Most High, that we can cry out and say, Father, Papa, what is next? And Lord, we know that you do all things for good for those who love the Lord, Father. We know that even though we live in this world of suffering and pain and not associated with Jesus, just with the things of this world and the fallen, fallen creation, Lord, that you're with us each and every step of the way. But Lord, help us to also to choose to deny ourselves and take up our cross and suffer with our Lord and Savior for the kingdom and for the gospel message. Lord, to have the compassion that Jesus had to feed the people, not just physical, but to feed them the words of life. So let us hear the words of life today, Lord, and take them into our hearts and, and apply them to action. To not be hearers of the word only, but doers, and to do that together as the body of Jesus Christ, the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled this, Who Wants to Live an Insignificant Life? And I pondered with that title because it really doesn't fit kind of the ending, but it fits how I'm kind of starting. Um, In chapter 9, Jesus tells us that he was born, literally, to be rejected, to suffer and die. That's why the Messiah came, and the Old Testament speaks clearly of that. But yet the people of Israel didn't see that because they wanted a Savior in a different way. They wanted a political Savior that would save them. They wanted a physical Savior that would give them the things that they needed. They didn't fix their eyes as much on the spiritual 
Because we look so much at this t today and what's going on instead of infinity and beyond, as Buzz Lightyear would say, I guess. I just thought about that. That we have in heaven, infinity, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this life is so instantaneous compared to that that doesn't even compare. Why do we not fixate on the eternal, which Scripture tells us to? Jesus denied Himself of being God, came to the very creation that with breath was created and was created in such majesty and wonder. The stars declare the heavens' glory. We sit in a galaxy where we can look at that and see all those things. And the stars obey the command. They're set into motion. We don't have to worry about the chaos of that and everything. Do we obey our Savior and our Lord's voice? He denied being a creator to live a life as a human being, but He lived a sinless life so that He could take our place. He came to deny Himself, to take up His cross, and pay the price of our sins. And after this... Jesus was raised back to physical life and then ascended into heaven into glory. Is that how you view your life? It should be, especially as a child of God. This life is momentary and your life was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you do as the scriptures that Mark read and the message this time when I read it, I do not do it all the time, but sometimes I do. It was just so refreshing in that I wanted to just to share that with you too. Papa, what's next? Do you have that kind of excitement? Or do you hesitate in so many times and when it comes to that, what will God call me to do next? With that type of attitude. Versus, what's next, Lord? I mean, that's the kind of fervency we should have. Even if we were in Luke chapter 9, it was crazy for them to understand. I'll follow you, Lord. You have the words of life. You're the Messiah then t deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. It's not what I expected. It's not what I desired. It's not what I wanted, but it's God's plan that He's working through you as long as you're an obedient, humble servant. So do you believe? Then will you follow Jesus? A couple weeks ago, I gave you that invitation so that you'd see just those two words, follow me. So maybe you would think about, how am I following Jesus Christ? Do I take this salvation with fear and trembling and work it out in my life? Do the things that are eternal, is that what I am fixated on? Am I, am I fixing my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? That means you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after Jesus. I repeat those words constantly here. I repeat those co words constantly in my mind to remind me. And I'll say again that Luke wrote in to take up your cross daily. He added that word daily. He's a physician that was meticulous. If you want to live, eat that apple every day. Don't eat it sometimes. Take your heart medication. You do that. Eat the bread of life and drink living water so that you can be nourished and so that you can live and then live out that life. If you do go through suffering for the cross, just as Jesus, you'll be raised up to eternal glory. And we're going to get to that part of the Scripture today I told you we would this week. How to be great in the kingdom. Not only great, but be the greatest, Jesus says. So who would ever want to miss out on future glory? There's where I ask you, who would want to live an insignificant life? Because they're tied totally together. Because this life is not about the fame and the things we get. And when you think of significance in the ways of the world, if you're not fixing your eyes on the eternal, not fixing your eyes on Jesus, you're going to look at what the world does. Oh, to be significant, I need to be wealthy. To be significant, I need to be free. To be significant, I need to be somebody. To be significant, I need to have a household of children. Whatever it is, a good career. Whatever you think in those terms. But Jesus tells you clearly, we'll get to that and talk about it more, that you give up all of that for Him. That doesn't mean He's going to ask you to quit your job, to leave and go to a foreign mission field. It just means that He asks you, period, to put Him as Lord of your life. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He wants your full allegiance, not a half-hearted harlot type affair. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? 
Do you love the one who loved you enough to lay down his life after choosing to deny himself and suffer and die? A lot of times we love to profess, but we don't love the suffering that goes with it. But Paul said also that, and, and put it in terms of Jesus as well, that that was a glorious thing to suffer and then to know the power of resurrection. If you're not experiencing that in your life, I pray that you think about it. But if you ask any child, because we're going to see a child come into the picture here, would you want to live an insignificant life? So that's why I'm taking it back to the child, because as an adult, you, you can definitely say, I don't want to live an insignificant life, but examine your life and see what the significant things were in your life. Are you living significantly for the kingdom? If you ask any child, do you want to live an insignificant life? They'll say, no, I have dreams, I have aspirations. I don't know what they'd be if you ask kids nowadays, but before when I was growing up, astronaut or, or doctor or whatever it was, they, they desired for greatness because it's built into them by God. But make sure you're building eternal things, not building castles on sand. Make sure that your eyes are fixated on Jesus. Make sure that you deny yourself a life of self-denial. Take up your cross, whatever that is for the kingdom, and you follow after Jesus. Will you follow me? Now, I said that we're going to see an example of being like a child, childlike. I mean, clarify that. That doesn't mean to be childish, does it? That's a total difference. And so many times when we chase after the other things of the world, I would define that as childish rather than childlike. If you look at Google and type in simply, what is childlike versus childish? You'll find this. Childish commonly means silly or immature. This adjective usually, but not always, points to unfavorable qualities. Childlike, though, means trusting or innocent, and it generally refers to the more positive and favorable qualities of a child. Do you trust the Lord your God? Do you have that faith that when the sea is rough and everything else, not only will Jesus protect you, but that He'll come to you, and if you have enough faith and fix your eyes on Him, you can walk on water? Because that happened in other Gospels, if you're reading along. At this point, we don't read about it in Luke. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, we read this. He who descended is the very one who ascended above all the heavens in order to fill all things. And it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for works of ministry to build up the body of Christ, which includes all of us, until we all, there we go, reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to full measure of the stature of Christ. So we come with childlike faith. We never lose that childlike faith to inherit the kingdom, but yet we mature so that we understand this glorious gift we've been given, this salvation through Jesus Christ. So are you, first of all, childlike, not childish, but second of all, are you mature? Are you growing in that faith, still holding on to the childlike qualities that are good, the trusting and the innocence and everything, but are you maturing so that you realize that you are a part of the kingdom of God and every part has a part and a purpose and we work together to fulfill that purpose to be the church, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So I ask again, do you want to live an insignificant life? No mature adult would say that. No child would say that. So are you living that, image, that, that significant life or is there some places you need to mature, some places that are childish in your life? Luke 9, verse 44. Let these words sink into your ears. That's the Berrien Study Bible. The NIV says, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. I came to preach the kingdom, to offer salvation to not condemned, to give freedom to the captive, sight to the blind, hearing to those who are deaf, so that they would understand the kingdom of heaven. The chosen one, the Son of God, the Messiah, had come to save His people. And I'm going to do that by being delivered into the hands of men where I will be rejected, 
where I will be belittled, where I will be mocked, where I will suffer, and I will die. And the, uh, the disciples did not understand that. Verse 45, but they did not understand this statement. It was veiled from them so that they could not comprehend it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. But the thing is, is you're not veiled anymore. If you're a child of God, it's clear. You've been given the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. You realize God's plan, and His plan is for you to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Not to be orphaned, but to be empowered by the Spirit, a temple of God, a royal priesthood to serve Him, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God. It's your only act of reasonable service. Are you fixated on the things of this world and the significance this world has to offer or the significance of being a child in the kingdom of heaven and the eternal riches that come through suffering to see the power of resurrection in your life? Jesus' command to you is to believe and to follow Him. Next, verse 46, Then an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Don't you find that? Let me see what word I want to use. Insane at this point? With everything that, that Jesus is teaching them and everything, they are caught up in self. We're doing the kingdom work, but Lord, aren't we great because we are? We have left these things behind. But He's already told them you lack in faith and everything else. But yet, like I said, it's normal. That's why I put it this way, to want to be great. But do it without the pride. Do it with self-humility and self-denial. Do it by taking up a cross, by being humiliated. The exact total opposite that the world would expect. That we live such good lives that even though they cast stones at you, even though they want to kill you, they don't find fault in you. They have to say to themselves, why does this person believe and live this way? And then you can tell them. 1 Peter 3.15, to tell them of the hope that you have because you submit to authority where even wives submit to their husbands. And don't take the Scripture out of text. They take it in the purpose that the Scripture is written. That we all submit. Do you submit to your King and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If you read Matthew and Mark's Gospels, the same sequence of events comes about. Verse 47, But Jesus, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, what does that say to you? That that says that my pride is focused on the wrong thing. It's about me. I don't love the Lord with all my heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and I don't love others myself because I want to set myself up to be a little better. I don't want to be a servant of all, which Jesus came to be the suffering servant. Jesus, knowing the thoughts of their hearts what you live for, what your desires are, where you'll build up treasures. He had a little child stand beside him. Small child. Little's in there. Not, not a child like this, child like this. So what does that tell me? That child probably has some childish traits, definitely. But we're looking at the childlike traits again, not the childish traits. That that child has trust. That child has innocence. That child is fully reliant on another human being to take care of their needs. That's the biggest thing I want to point out here. Totally reliant for daily bread. They're not going to go out and get it themselves. They trust. And then they can go and say, what's next, Papa, and get past that. And let me put them down here a little bit further as you get older. Then I can throw them up in the arms and catch them because this one I probably would drop. But they have that trust. To say, what's next, Papa? Because they have put their total trust in someone else to provide them, take care of them, to give them the fun things in life while keeping them safe doing it. Verse 48, And he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Well, how can I welcome someone if I'm worried about the pride in my life and the significance in my life as far as human standards go? And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Well, that's obvious. You've already declared who I am. I, I am the one who has the words of life. You said it, Peter. There's no way we can walk away from you, even though if you read in John that most of the disciples left Jesus that day because they couldn't take the teachings. 
that Jesus was the bread of life that came down from heaven, that in the wilderness their ancestors ate manna that came down from heaven, and they died. And I know that I'm going to die, so Jesus has got to be talking about here spiritual life. And he says that. You eat the bread of life, my, which is my flesh, and you will live eternally. Are you feeding on Jesus? For whoever is the least among all of you, he is the greatest. Now, like I said, it's not just about being great. The words used here are greatest. John, we're going to get to him in a minute because he speaks more. He didn't want to just be great. He wanted to be greater than the other 11. He wasn't just, hey, we're greater than these other guys, and that's going to come up in a minute because he said, what about those guys over there, Jesus? He wanted to be greater than Peter. He wanted to be greater than James. And he's got to be thinking right now, I just saw Jesus up on the mountain. Well, should have, again made him fixate his eyes on the eternal rather than saying, hey, I want to be greater than the rest of these guys. In just a minute, we'll read where he compares himself to Elijah because he wants to rain down fire like Elijah from heaven. I don't want to just be great. I want to be the greatest. But what it would, would it profit me if I gained the whole world and lose my soul? There's nothing wrong with wanting to be great, but know what you want to be great in. Be great in the kingdom, which means a totally different understanding and, and thought process in heart than it was before. I need to repent, change the way that I think, so it changes my heart, because he knew the motives of their heart, so that I serve my Lord and Savior. And all these other blessings and riches and grace upon grace upon grace, I thank God for in my life, and I enjoy those things, but they're not my idols. They're not what I live for. Whoever is the least among you, not less, but the least. John wants to be the greatest. Each of them there want to be the greatest because there's an argument that broke out at that point. And if you want to be the greatest, Jesus said, you've got to be the leastest. I know that's not a word. No one wants to live an insignificant life. They want to live a great life. Admit it. There's nothing wrong with it. And then move forward on what you want to live it on. James even tells us in James chapter 4, verses 1, in the beginning of verse 2, what causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the passions at war within you? You crave what you do not have. It took me forever to understand that verse. Because I'm like, I don't do that. Yeah, I do. That's what we all do. We want the promotion, which is a good thing, but we want the promotion, how bad? What if the guy that's up against you needs that extra money to support his family so that they will live better, and you don't? You've got plenty. Would you give up that promotion? And I'm not telling you to. I'm just asking you where your thoughts and your heart are. I don't know your heart, but Jesus knows your thoughts and your hearts. And he's gonna, we're going to see as we progress in this that he doesn't want anything but less than 100%. Later in James chapter 4, start in verse 6, at the end of verse 6, this is why it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, self-denial. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and weep. Turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And as I put, read these scriptures, I think all the way back to the Sermon on the Plain and everything else Jesus has taught them to live a life of humility, to, de to deny the things that they thought were before, to consider them as rubbish, as Paul says. And they've been given the power and the authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to preach the good news. And yet when the John came off the mountain, here, here he had a face with Jesus that the disciples couldn't cast out the demon that the man brought. He brought his son to the church. After telling of his suffering and death, and I keep saying John because he comes up in the scripture here, he was arguing with the others about who was the greatest. And Jesus reinforces again that to be great, you've got to deny yourself to the point of being the least. 
So which one would you choose? Which one are you choosing? That's a tough thing to be a, live a life of self-denial. But it's the first step. You'll never, ever take up a cross for Jesus if you don't deny yourself first. Then John changes the subject. Watch this in verse 49. Master, said John, he, he, know, he, he makes it known that Jesus is his master. I am listening to what you say because I'm going to do it. We saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not accompany us. What? That doesn't even follow the, the sequence of events, except it does when my heart is focused on wrong things. Oh, you're getting a little close to the subject matter here, Lord. <laughs> I'm not quite ready for self-denial. I'm, I'm getting there, and I'm greater at it than these other guys. <laughs> so we see this other guy, and we change the subject, and, and, and certainly you're going to say back to me, he didn't expect the answer that he got again. Certainly you're going to say to me, yes, you are one of the twelve. Jesus' answer was not that. Verse 50 said, Do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. Oh, wait a minute. I was just trying to um, justify myself. I heard his words about being least, but certainly I'm somebody. Uh, this guy's not being trained by the master. He's just out there. Whoever is not against you is for you. I say again, what would it profit you to gain the whole world? What does it matter if you're significant in the eyes of men? Jesus, God Himself, became flesh and blood as a child, grew up, didn't have a place to lay His head as we re read on in the Scriptures, so that He could suffer and die for you. And then he stayed 40 days teaching more about the kingdom of heaven before he ascended into heaven. And even at that time, the apostle said, Are you going to restore the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Israel now, Lord? And he said, You don't need to know the answers to all things. Those are in God's timing. All you need to know is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Are you a witness for Jesus Christ? Does your life proclaim Him? He is, is He your Lord of all? Or are you concerned upon, about the things of this world? Will you lose your life to save it or not? In this chapter, we've watched the disciples progress from a perverted faith. I put that in there because that's the words that are found in Scripture. A perverted prayer life because they didn't pray enough. And now a perverted idea of what is great. Because again, their eyes are focused on material rather than eternal. And Jesus answers them not with ridicule or condemnation or rebuke at this point. He just simply says, if you want to be great, here's how. And don't compare yourself to someone else. Well, How many times do we do that? Especially inside the church. I don't want to associate them because they are a talked to someone this week and it came up that I'm a pastor and everything and you know when I said free Methodist there was a little bit hmm <laughs> and I said well let me clarify I said do you know what a free Methodist is no I don't <laughs> and then we talked and talked and there you know about that and had a good conversation about Jesus Christ being our Lord we got past any of these things that cause trouble because we want to compare to them You know, it's funny, children don't do that again. They can get mad at each other because you took your toy and everything else and five minutes later they're loving all over each other because they keep no records of wrongs. So I ask this question. How much of the world will you not let go of? Because Jesus asks you to get rid of it all. He asked that young rich ruler to go sell everything he had, give it to the poor, and then come follow him. And that man walked away sad because he had great wealth in this world. There are eternal consequences. So if you don't want to be insignificant, then I assume you would want to be great, even the greatest. So there's nothing wrong with that. But again, it's how you focus. 
You must fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith. Hebrews 12 starts this way. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all that we read about that live by faith, that suffered and died for their faith, who had tremendous faith, Abraham enough to, to, to go and sacrifice his son, but God didn't require that of him. But he knew, it tells us in the scriptures there, they knew that if he did, that God had the power to restore life to his, only chi- to his child. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. Oh, pride's got to be one of them here. And let us run with endurance the race set out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are you following in that path? Are you following Jesus? Consider him. Think carefully, who endured such hostility from sinners so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Your heart, first of all, has got to be fixated on Jesus, not the things of this world. Here's some of Jesus' actual words from Matthew chapter 18, verse 3 and 4. Truly I tell you, or listen up, verily, verily, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Never enter. Enter it. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus goes on at that point to tell them, the disciples and the ones listening at that point, not to stumble, of course, but to not to cause other people to stumble. Maybe that moat needs to be pulled out of your eye. Maybe you don't need to judge others. Maybe you need to forgive so that you'll be forgiven. Maybe you don't need to be blind so you're not leading the blind into a pit of destruction. Is Jesus your Lord? Is He your everything? Mark's Gospel in Mark 9.35 adds this to, the, to our learning. If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and the servant of all. The dulios, the slave who answers only to the master and trusts that the master will take care of him. And even if the master is a mean and cruel master, he still lives and lives out his testimony and his witness. Surely John comprehends this by this point. I don't know why he changed the topic, but he did. But let's read on. What happens next? Verse 51 of Luke 9, As the day of his ascension was approached, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus is headed toward his cross. He has denied himself, denied himself, denied himself, spent a life of prayer, spent a life teaching, and he is going to take up his cross so that he can die to save you, his enemy. He sent messengers on ahead. He went into the village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him, but the people there refused to welcome him. Oh, man, those people. This is nothing new. Luke's gospel's already pointed it out. Remember when they tried to throw him off the cliff and kill him? Jesus is, is, has received, Come on, Lord, we want these things because we want you to feed us. We don't want the uh, bread of life. He has refaced, he's faced rejection and, and, and murder. He saved the man on the other side of the lake, and the people said, Oh, no, our economy or whatever reasons was, we might suffer. Get out of here. So this is nothing uncommon. What's the difference here is this is those half-breed brothers of ours that we don't like. So now I can even add inside the church, I don't like those from that denomination or from that church or from that side of the road. Why? We all sin and fall short of God's glory and don't stand too firm in your faith lest you fall. What's the reason they did reject him? But the people refused to welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. Jesus didn't have time to take care of their immediate desires and needs because he was going to take care of their eternal soul. But we don't see that so many times. We missed out on it. When the disciples, James and John, two that were just up on the mountain, saw this, they asked, and remember, John wanted to be greater than James. He didn't want to be equal to his brother. Come on especially you guys that have siblings. <laughs> but when the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, just like he rebuked the demon, just like he rebuked Peter and said that he had the mindset of Satan, not the things of God. And his, he and his disciples went on to another village. 
I don't know what your text has. What, do you, your, what does yours have if you're following along for verses 54, 55, and 56? Here's where we don't have enough scriptural, textual uh, proofs, try to, get, try to get my words right, to say that some of these words might be in the scripture and might not. So yours might not have some things missing. But I want to read to, to you what's in some of the text. Okay? Some translations in verse 54 say, just like Elijah did. Okay, if that's not supposed to be there, who do you think Peter and, I mean, James and John are thinking of? Especially since they saw Elijah up on the mountain. What would anybody think about calling fire down from heaven? You would think about Elijah. So the, it's given even if the words aren't there. So now James and John, like I said, are putting themselves back to, we talked about why Moses and Elijah were there on the mountain, it's the law and the prophets. They're putting themselves back there with the great Elijah. Jesus has just said, if, you're, if these people aren't against us, they're for us. He's already said, be the least. And now I want to be so great and con con condemning and judgmental that I want to rain down fire because these are my half-breed brothers. If it would have been some other place, I probably wouldn't have said that. Where is my mind and my heart focused? What do I need to empty out of it and sweep out of it so that it's all about Jesus and nothing else? How could I have anger in my heart? How could I let the sun set on that with still anger in my heart? Verse 55, some scripts have, you do not know what kind of spirit you are. Well, that would be true whether the words are there or not. Again, that's what Jesus said about Peter, that his thought process, his mind, his heart was coming from his father, the devil, not his father, God. Verse 56, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy the lives of men, but to save them. Even if your text doesn't have it again there, it's implied. Why did Jesus come? To seek and save the lost. He told Zacchaeus to come down out of that tree because today salvation had come to his house. Today, that offer might not be there tomorrow. Why in the world, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, would you think of yourself more highly than you ought to, want to be judgmental enough to rain down fire from heaven, and to not want to do what Jesus has told a disciple to do? Anyone who wants to come and follow after me must do these things. The cost of following Jesus is expounded in these next verses beyond anything that you can go back and say, well, maybe this isn't the case. Verse 57, As they were walking along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Maybe there was part of that conversation there, maybe it wasn't, maybe this is a little later on down the road. But someone came up to Jesus and said, I recognize you as the rabbi, I will follow you wherever you go. I will give my devotion to you, I will give up my life for you, I will follow after you to be like you. Wherever you go, that's a big statement, and they knew what that meant because it meant I gave up everything and I'm going here wherever you go. So many Christians are, I'll follow you, but not there, but not now. And let's look at their answers. Um, Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I'll, I'll just say a little bit more about it in a minute. Then he said to another man, so Jesus calls out, follow me. There's that invitation. Follow me. It's already implied with the follow that you leave the world behind, you give up everything else, and you follow me and only me. The man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the dead bury their own dead. You, however, you, pointing him out, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. What's he to do? Proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me bid farewell to my family. Then Jesus declared, no one who has put his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? You have to be to this point in the gospel. And we're wrapping up that Luke chapter 9 pivotal uh, point of the whole text. And are you going to or not? Or are you going to turn back like we see in John 6? Will you? Have you, will you continue to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus? Because if you haven't, if you haven't given up this world, 
and you longingly look back on top of that, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So let's examine these verses. First, a man came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. He understood that. That means wherever, whenever, however, anywhere. Wait a minute. Um, progression it makes total sense here in my mind. I can say that, but um, there's a lot of conditions there. There's no conditions in following Jesus, none whatsoever. He died for your sins so that you could live powerfully for Him. The old man is gone, the new has come. Do you understand this? Anywhere? Everywhere? Whenever? Think carefully before you answer this. But let me ask you again, do you want to live an insignificant life? Do you want to be great? Do you want to live a life of worth? Do you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Is there any chance you'll hear, depart from me, I do not know you? I'm going to read you Hebrews again. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, think what those witnesses were. Some were sawn in half. Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. <sighs> Biggest sin that I'm seeing here again from reading this is my lack of self-denial because I won't. You can call it pride. You can call it whatever you want. I won't. Won't. And if you look at these answers, what was the key problem in all these, in these, these uh, interactions with Jesus? It was I first, Jesus second. Okay? Uh, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider, how, consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider all of this. As we read later in that chapter, verses 28 and 29, Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for God is a consuming fire. Consider your answers carefully. Consider where your heart is focused. Eternity is at, is at stake. Jesus' answer, Jesus' answer could have been anything to the man, but His answer was, you're not going to have a place to call home. That's cruel. Now, I didn't say again that God's going to make you give up your family and everything else, but He's got to be willing. He said, are you willing to not have a home? Foxes have a den. They go in, they go out. They find food, they go back for shelter, for safety. You're not going to have those things anymore. Birds, they can soar through the sky and see the, see the glories of, of things more and everything. They get food, they go out, they come back, they find a nest where they feel safe and secure. You might not have those things if you follow me. You may not even have a place to lay your head. No safety, no shelter, no rest. You've given it all up to me. It's a one-way trip. And where am I headed? To suffering and death. Are you willing to follow? Are you sure that you're willing to follow there and everywhere that I call you? Then Jesus calls out to the second man because he's just made that statement at the first. Follow me. You just considered all this. Now, will you answer that call? Uh, did you answer that invitation? Have you answered that invitation? How did you answer the Lord? Did you answer with procrastination or hesitation or divided heart or lack of faith? This is what the next thing is. Lord, let me do this first, and then I'll do you second. I'm still Lord of my life, even though I say you are. The thing is, I've got to admit myself and take myself off that, that, that throne that I think I'm on. Because Jesus is clear, I'm, if, if I'm still on the throne, He's not. And I'm not following Him. And I'll live out not only an insignificant life at best, I might miss out on seeing and entering the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' answer is, let the dead bury the dead. If any excuse would have been good enough, this would have been one because of the state of family and, the, and the, the responsibilities of the son. This would have been a good excuse for anybody to put off what was coming next. Even to a rabbi, but not the king of kings and lord of lords. 
He says that you've got to give up everything to inherit that much more, to inherit more brothers and sisters if that's what it takes. He came to not to, to bring peace, but to bring division. We know He came to bring, to bring peace, but when it's talking about in that Scripture that you'd be divided in your own household because of your faith, because of your trust in Jesus Christ. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do you love your home, your family, more than you love Jesus? Jesus' answer was you, however, you specifically go and proclaim the kingdom. The second man was called. He appears that he'll answer the call, but when you look at it, he hesitated. He didn't have the faith that he needed. It was more about himself. Then we get to just five more minutes. Lord, that's all I need. I just need to say goodbye. Well, surely if it requires immediate, I don't have time to do the things that I need to do. Surely five minutes will be okay. Right? <laughs> Jesus' answer is, No one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. If you sign up for following after Jesus, and not just look back at the desires, but let anything else keep you from being fixated on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Whatever that is, then it's causing you to, to plow non-straight roads. Rows. Do you get that in the farming analogy? No one does this again. It's a, it's, they understood that at this time. They plow the field, and if they look back, the rows are getting like this because they've missed the point that their eyes are fixated on. Mine's fixated right now on Carl's house. If I want to make it to Carl's house, I walk keeping my eyes fixated on it and I reach my destination. If I look back any, I could stumble and fall on those steps. I could be walking over here before it's too long. What a mess that field would be. The sower came to plant his seed. The seed is the word of God. Some fell on noble hearts and produced a crop. What kind of crop are you producing? Are you following Jesus as your Lord and Savior at all? All three of those cases said you're going to have to give up your home as you know it. I didn't say you're going to lose everything. didn't say anything else because that's a fearful thought. But is it worth it for the kingdom? And in every one of those cases said, Me first, Lord, then you. So they've got to get you to thinking, What do I put over Jesus? Is he the love of my life over, over everything? Will I follow him anywhere, any, anytime, anything else? He gave up his life for me. What am I not willing to give up for him? I close with that. I'm going to pray and we're going to take communion. I want you to be thinking about that as you join in. Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The bread represents his body given for me and the blood, the, the blood of the new covenant poured out for me. That I don't, the law is never going to, to make me right because I'm a sinner. I'm saved by grace alone through faith. It's nothing that I can do. And Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And we see that in the transfiguration and everything. That we take this new covenant, that we participate in it, because we know that this new covenant cannot be broken. It will not fail. There's no other scriptures that need to be added to this, anything else. Your job, as we've already read in Luke chapter 9, is to believe. But if you believe, then you do, you live. And you don't truly believe if you've got yourself stuck in the way, your family stuck in the way, anything else, your doubts, your fears, your insecurity. We're to the part where next we're going to see Jesus send out more disciples. Will you sell everything, give it to the poor, and follow Jesus, or whatever it is in your life? Or will you continue to have other idols? And will you miss the promised land? Is Jesus your everything? Because this is His body broken for you, and this is His blood poured out for you. Drink the living water and live. Eat the bread of life and live eternally. Because your sins are forgiven, child of God. You are a new creation. Nothing will happen to you outside of God's will and power and grace. And when we die, it will be to our glory. 
So let's live a life of worth until He comes. Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You for You are a mighty God, a God that chooses to save, to give us every opportunity to follow after You. And Jesus tells us that His yoke is not burdensome, that He'll come along beside of us and team up for the work to be done. Lord, help us not to look back, but to look for, towards the future. And we pray, Lord, that as, as we give up our lives to serve you, Lord, that you will take care of our family and our home because you're the giver of all things, that you give us oxygen each day to breathe that we don't deserve. We deserve your wrath. But Jesus Christ took it for, for us, that he did pour out his blood, that he did have his body pierced for us, that he did suffer and die, and that he rose again to eternal life. And He has asked us to follow Him even in suffering so that we might have future rewards in heaven, future glory in heaven. We thank You for Your Spirit that seals and binds us and calls us Your own so that we can cry out to You, Father, what's next? With enthusiasm, maybe some anticipation and anxiety somewhat too because we're human beings, Lord, but increase our faith so that we'll follow you, Jesus wherever that goes. And we put everything else in your hand as sovereign Lord that you know the desires of our heart and want to give good gifts to children. And if we know that at all, what greater gifts do you want to give? So we ask you, Lord, to protect our family, to protect our friends, to bring your spirit into the presence of our home. Lord, to drive out Satan and the spiritual forces of darkness, to save our children so that they will continue to live a light of light. So Lord, increase the light in us so that we may live brightly to serve you. We proclaim this in Jesus' name. Amen.